From awaytogarden.com and robinhoodradio.com, this is A Way to Garden with Margaret Roach, your weekly invitation to dig in and grow. The word downsizing was spoken more than once when Paige Dickey and her husband were making plans a few years back to leave their beloved home and big old garden called Duck Hill in Westchester County, New York, for a new one. Well, the new piece of land turned out to be bigger than the last, and it has fostered in Paige a whole new relationship to gardening, especially a more intimate connection to nature and the property's wildish areas. Starting over and the surprises along the way are the subject of Paige's new book called Uprooted, A Gardener Reflects on Beginning Again. And we'll talk about it with her in a moment, but first these messages. Programming and underwriting support from Brushwood Nursery. For more than 20 years, Brushwood Nursery has shipped the finest selection of clematis and other vines all over the United States with full gallon-sized plant and free shipping. Their website is full of beautiful pictures and information on growing clematis. Brushwoodnursery.com. Programming and underwriting support from Garden Tool Company. Garden Tool Company's wide selection of heirloom quality, quality tools for your gardening passion is backed by outstanding customer service, fast shipping, and ongoing support. GardenToolCompany.com. Paige Dickey is a popular garden writer and author of numerous books, including her newest called Uprooted. And she was the co-founder of the Garden Conservancy Open Days National Garden Visiting Program. I'm so glad to welcome her back today to hear about what happens when a gardener transplants herself. Hi, Paige. Hi, Margaret. So congratulations. Another book. (laughs) Thank you. I think my last. Um, so before we get started, I say that speaking of the book, we're going to have a book giveaway with the transcript of the show on awaytogarden.com. And also that you have a lot of events coming up, most of which are virtual, obviously, this year. And so yes. we'll give all the links to those, including one we're doing together, yes? Yes, great. Thank you, Margaret. Yeah, so that one is October 6th, the Tuesday in the evening, uh, Eastern Time, and that's for Oblong Books, I think. And um, you, you're doing one for the New York Botanical Garden later in October, and Berkshire Botanical Garden, and Tower Hill Botanic Garden, and so forth. So we'll we'll be sure to mention all of those to people. Um, that's terrific. So yeah, so down to business. The book it begins with an Anton Chekhov quote. <laughs> um, it says, "I am in the condition of a transplanted tree which is hesitating whether to take root or begin to wither." And it looks like you took root, Paige. So tell us a little bit, sort of set the scene about this transition for us. Well, I think in the beginning, and and certainly when when I didn't know whether. I might wither. Um, it was it was very hard to leave uh, my old garden. Um, I'd been there for thirty four years. Uh, my husband joined me for the last fourteen of them, and and it, it was um, a place created over the years with just tremendous amount of love and passion. And um, and to just walk away from that was was difficult, um, but after much searching and and uh, lots of panic when we really couldn't find anything right away, um, we had decided to move to northwestern Connecticut, and we found a plot of land that that took my breath away and. Because it was full of fields and woods and wildland and a view of the Berkshire Hills, and um, it started me on a new adventure. And I think that's when I did. I realized I wasn't going to wither. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we didn't have to irrigate. Don't worry, she's going to be okay. <laughs> oh, how how did so? So you had been at Duck Hill for those 34 years, and so you came to start again, and as you said, this piece of property was breathtaking. It, it took your breath away, And but how do you know t- where to begin? Because both of us, we were much younger gardeners, much less experienced okay. gardeners when <laughs> we, when we began our where I still live around the same time as when you went to Duck Hill and where in your, your work at Duck Hill. So we were experimenting with different things. Um, uh, we were at a different stage in our, as I said, in our experience. How did you know 
Like what lessons, where did you begin? How did you know what to do first when you got to this new place? Do you know what I mean? Like what, what did you say? Ah, I've got to dot, dot, dot. Do you know? Yeah. I, well, first of all, there were remnants uh, of a, of a garden, a sort of cottagey garden in the front of the house. And, and, and although it, it crossed my mind to just wipe it all out. Um, of course I didn't. And it was mostly just peonies. And so I knew that I wanted to play with that, and that would be my perennial garden, you might say, or a place for perennials and, and bulbs, and a place we walk through every time we go inside and out. So um, so it would it would be a fun place to have that sort of a garden. But I realized almost immediately I didn't want a garden like I had at Duck Hill. Duck Hill was full of hedges and and um, boxwood topiary, and it, it was a series of rooms, and it was very enclosed. And this new place where we lived was open to the sky and open to the fields and open to the view. And I realized I didn't want a hedged-in garden anymore. I wanted something that related to that wildness. So I, I, I think I knew pretty much right away that I wanted a lot of natives in, the, in, the, in this little garden, things like Amsonia and Baptisia and... Um, uh, asters and so on, and but then at the same time as I was thinking about what to do about this little garden, I was starting to explore in the woods. We I think we have about eleven acres of woods, and I got so excited about the woods. We have high, rocky, limestone, dramatic woods on one side and low, rich, damp woods on the other side. And I got so excited about this wild land that all of a sudden we were the stewards of um, that I was almost torn, half interested in creating a new garden, half of me just wanting to start walks, start paths in the woods, and start cutting down the invasives. And and um, so that was a whole new world that excited me right from the beginning. Mm. You know, I was thinking about that as I was reading the new book, as I was reading Uprooted, um, again, how different gardening, you know, quote unquote, the word gardening, what it means today compared to when we both began gardening. And, and that's so you know, true. Yeah, how we couldn't wait to get back then, the new collector plant, usually from another country, often yeah. Asian or Eurasian, right? And, yeah. you know, some some rarity. And now we can't wait to sort of discover the latest fungi that's coming up at this time of year if we get a rain or or the butterfly chrysalis that's on you know hanging from something and you, you know it's it, and, and as you say the native plants it's such a tremendous change in thinking in horticulture I think um, you know uh, yeah I do I and and Margaret it has it has a lot to do with your and my evolution as gardeners Mm -hmm. And our age, I think, and our wisdom, perhaps. But it also has to do with people like Doug Tallamy, who came out with this wonderful book called Bringing Nature Home, and and other people like Doug uh, Tallamy, who opened our eyes to the whole idea of having habitats that that support birds and butterflies. Um, and 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 what that means, which of course means caring more for and planting more native plants. Yeah, yeah. For me, besides Doug's work at University of Delaware, um, also the 
I remember when I first read about, and this was quite a number of years ago, but the variety trials of native plants by Richard Hockey at Chicago Botanic Garden and then also at Mount Cuba Center. At, at Mount in Delaware. Cuba, I love those trials. Yeah, where they take, you know, all the cultivars of some native and, and do them side by side and see which ones. Exactly. Yeah, like like yeah. the new summer flocks called, I think it's called Jenna or Gina, yes. um, that has quite small flowers, but attracts more butterflies than any other native summer flocks, which I thought yeah. was so, so neat. I mean, yeah. I confess, I immediately went out and bought it. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> um, so, so, so you've been exploring. So, so just tell us. So, so the garden you partly out of a nod to the past to the previous owner, and and also because of the practical consideration that you could walk by it every day. You sort of let that space in the front be the perennial garden. Are there other areas that you're gardening in a more horticultural way versus the work that I want to talk about a little more, you know, sort of in the woods, so to speak? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Um, There are a few uh, holdovers, you might say, from Duck Hill. One, I love gravel. And um, now we have a couple of gravel terraces and uh, that that just kind of bleed, that lure you out from the doors into the garden and or into the land really but in one of those gravel places i'm i'm playing with things just seeding not necessarily native things annuals and bulbs and 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 plants that like to to grow in gravel things like miss wilmot's ghost that incredible um Orangium and um, and a scabiosa ochreluca, which is a dancing thing that loves to grow in gravel. Um, and then I also a couple of things. I, I still wanted cutting flowers and a place to grow lettuces, so I did make a little pattern cutting garden um, that gets wild and woolly this time of year. Um, because lots of things seed in the gravel, and I just let them flower, <clears throat> like cosmos. So those are really holdovers or, or echoes, you might say, of Duck Hill. And then Bosco was craving a greenhouse, because he had one at Duck Hill. So craziness. We build a little greenhouse, which is high, high maintenance, but it's what he loves more than anything, and he it's his playground. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so, the, so you know, yes, and 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 then I planted fruit trees because I so because we used to have a little orchard, and and I love orchards. I love rows of trees. I love grids of trees. So, in one spot where there were already some old pears and an old apple, we just went with that and, and put in some fruit trees. Mm. So, so there are some elements of horticulture slash, slash agriculture. Um, no question. <laughs> yeah. And, and so then in the woods, what would you say have been, uh, are, are there some discoveries? I mean, you said taking out invasives and that's a a lifelong task, of course, but are there some plants? Did you discover oh, some my things goodness, in there that yes. you, yeah? Well, first yeah. of all, we, you know, we're, somebody called it the Marble Valley. We're, we're near the Housatonic River and, and the, the soil here, the rock formation is very alkaline. It's, it's a calcareous soil. So there are wildflowers in the woods, um, I had never seen before. I had, I mean, they weren't just jack in the pulpits and and trilliums. They were things like desmodium and and uh, um, and uh, Pacara obovata, which is a little ground cover, which is the only um, plant. The leaves are the only foliage um, that the larvae of the 
endangered northern meadowlark butterfly like to eat. Hmm. So all the butterfly experts get very excited at the thought that we have all this Pacara obovata. It only grows in limestone, rocky places. Um, So all kinds of discoveries like that. And then in the low woods, at one point it opens up to what turns out to be a fen, which is a calcareous wetland, which is rich in um, native plants. And there I see things that I grow in my garden in their native habitat, like um, all kinds of uh, um, <laughs> uh, Joe Pie weeds um, oh. and 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 a, the the milkweed called the swamp milkweed called Asclepias incarnata and and vervain and and all these it's just so thrilling to see these things in their native habitat. Um, and of course, asters, New England asters, and um, so yes, I mean, eye-opening uh, new d- discoveries, and um, that's been the thrill. You know, I have been um, so here we are, decades into gardening, <laughs> and here we are again. We started out as sort of plant collectory kind of people. The, the latest rarity was the thing, and. Um, and more designed um, plant combinations. And, and here, here now we both are walking around the fringe <laughs> of the places that we live, um, noting diversity and being astonished. And, you know, I know exactly where the little treasures are and in areas where I've stopped mowing up at the edge of the property in recent years, places I used to mow all the way up to the fence line, way up the hill, And it seemed crazy to keep doing it and I'd see what happened. And the other day I was just up there for something and along the edge of one one edge of the fence is uh, the big leaf aster. I think it's macrophyllus. And, um, you know, and it's, it's not that it's a rare plant or anything, but it's, how, Paige, how did it get there? It's I have been so subduing it to for see 30 these years. things in nature, and you had nothing to do with it. And it's just, um, I just find it such a thrill. I have a, a little book now, a little, I, I've always been a, a writer downer. And I have this little book, and it, it, it's just divided into all the di- in the front field, the back field, the high woods, the low woods, the fen, and then I write down every time I see a new native plant in there, um, because it, and it's just I, it's it's just a, a fun record. But um, same thing with with me, Margaret. I, I've been letting more and more grass go to meadow. Mm-hmm. Um, who needs all that grass? Mm-hmm. And um, our grass is horrible anyway. It's you know, it's not a uh, it's not a a, a carpet of anyway. Um, and all this little blue stem is mm-hmm. has has appeared, and it and it's every year there's more of it, and every year there's more bergamot. You know, um, uh, Monarda fistulosa and. It's just so exciting. I can't tell you. It is funny, isn't it? And I go around marching around like a crazy person (laughs) seeing all the oak seedlings. And that's another thing. You know, we say oak, but there's so many different ones. (laughs) And and, um, we have just so many oak seedlings here. And and we don't have a deer fence um, in the... In, I mean, I wish we did, but we have 17 acres, and um, it's just not yeah. in the budget. Anyway, and so I go around every couple of weeks and spray all these oak seedlings with deer defeat, which is just this organic, horrible, smelly stuff, which seems to help keep the deer away. And when I see an oak tree that... Um, really has a lot of sky above it, so I know it can grow and get big. Um, I we put a a wire, a little wire fence around it, mm. and um, 
It's very exciting to see. You're protecting your babies. <laughs> protecting our babies, yeah. Yeah. So as sort of a counterpoint, you say in the book, you know, a counterpoint to the wilder places that have really won your heart over at this new property, um, which I guess it has a name too, ch- the church house, yes? Well, it was a church, yes. I see. Um, so, so you say in the book, after compost heaps, cold frames were one of the features I wanted most when making the new garden. Yes. So, it, and there's this sort of October ritual, sort of a timely ritual that you talk about having to have the right cold frames to be able to force bulbs, a really a, sort of an old fashioned garden hobby that people did a lot more years ago than they do now. So yes. just tell us a little bit about the cold frames for a couple minutes. Well, I ha- we had cold frames at Duck Hill and Years and years and years and years ago, I used to sow seeds of perennials in trays and and have them over the winter in the cold frames, just the way Louise B.B. Wilder told me to do in one of her wonderful books. Um, But for the last, I don't know, uh, 30 years, I would guess, I've used the cold frames to force bulbs. So... Um, so I, I, I get, I order bulbs, all sorts of bulbs, but lots of different narcissus, daffodils, and crocuses, and scillas, and all sorts of things like that. And I, in October, I pot them up in nice clay pots, and then I sink them into, we now use, um, shavings, because we just buy shavings at Agway. And I sink them in the in the in shavings in the coal frames, and then we shut. I've watered them. We shut down the coal frames, and then wait. Usually about fourteen weeks, um, and then I start pulling them out and bringing them indoors. It's sort of like a. It is so fun. It is. It's just like this treat, and um, <laughs> and. It's just watching these little irises or daffodils or, or crocuses or hyacinths come into bloom in your house. And um, and I used to throw them away after they were spent and <laughs> until I married Bosco. And <laughs> um, he, being a, a refugee, doesn't throw anything away. And so he said, no, 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 we're going to plant them. And so now we plant them. The daffodils we plant under the apple trees, and I sneak the other bulbs in among the perennials. Mm. Um, and by gum, they, they keep flowering. They will flower the next year and the year after that. So you don't have to have a coal frame to do that. You can use an extra refrigerator. You can put pots of bulbs if you have an outdoor hatch to your uh to your cellar you can do it on one of those steps um you can do it in in a a styrofoam box in your garage if you if it if you can keep them from freezing you just don't want the pots to freeze Mm -hmm. um but our cold frames are three feet high in the back about a foot high in the front, and they're, they're three by three, wooden, and mm-hmm. then with a heavy plexiglass top. And, um, and that really, and I, I actually have three of them, so I have nine feet of coal frames. Used to have six feet. Well, and, uh- um, and and that works really well. We used to use glass. We used to use old storm windows, things like that. But the plexiglass is much easier, and it doesn't break. It's much mm. lighter. Well, I'm very and, jealous. I'm totally jealous, Paige, of your <laughs> um, your your bulb forcing um, apparatus, so to speak. Um, we're we're out of time, but I want to say how much I've been enjoying the book, and I'm looking forward to our conversation together, which is I think going to be uh, for Oblong Books, which I think is going to be a little bit about the wild spaces um, in more depth. Um, and so I hope I'll talk to you again soon. I know we have to talk again to prepare for that. So thank yes. you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Margaret.
All right. Talk to you soon. All right. Bye-bye. Programming and underwriting support from Garden Tool Company. Garden Tool Company's wide selection of heirloom quality, quality tools for your gardening passion is backed by outstanding customer service, fast shipping, and ongoing support. GardenToolCompany.com. Programming and underwriting support from Brushwood Nursery. For more than 20 years, Brushwood Nursery has shipped the finest selection of clematis and other vines all over the United States with full gallon-sized plant and free shipping. Their website is full of beautiful pictures and information on growing clematis. BrushwoodNursery.com. And I hope I'll speak to all the rest of you again soon. Now, don't miss an episode. You can subscribe free to the podcast version of the show on Stitcher or iTunes or Spotify. And you can find me anytime at awaytogarden.com or on Facebook or Instagram as at Away to Garden. And happy gardening meantime. Away to Garden with Margaret Roach is a joint production of awaytogarden.com and the smallest NPR station in the nation, Robin Hood Radio.